Welcome back. I hope you found that little whiteboard explanation of the mechanism of the birth control pill helpful. Um, this is the point in course after I go over the mechanism of the birth control pill that students usually have questions about it. Um, and so we usually get into a prompt to discussion and obviously that's a little bit harder to do on an online course. So I challenge you to take advantage of the chat room function. So if you have any questions, um, I developed a special chat room just for questions on the birth control pill and chat away and that way we can still have a discussion and you can get any questions you have answered. All right, moving along, remember there were two possible endings to our female hormonal cycle. We explored what happened if a woman doesn't get pregnant, but what if pregnancy occurs? So this hopefully is getting to be old hat to you by now. Um, if a pregnancy occurs, that means the zygote, um, the egg becomes fertilized, and now we call it a zygote. The zygote begins cleavage division, rapid mitosis without cell growth. It grows into the solid ball stage, which is the morula, and the hollow ball stage, which is the blastula. And in humans and other mammals, this is called the blastocyst. So just take a little reminder, look at this. So here we have ovulation. The egg pops out of the ovary. It goes into the fallopian tubes. Remember, if fertilization is going to occur, it's going to occur in the fallopian tubes. So again, if I ask you on a test or a quiz, where does fertilization occur? You want to say in the fallopian tubes or in the oviduct, not, you know, in the back seat or in the bedroom or whatever. You get the idea. So you have the zygote. It immediately starts undergoing cleavage division. Two cell, four cell, eight cell, solid ball stage, the morula, and then the hollow ball stage, the blastocyst. And remember, this is the stage that in plants, in the human female or an any mammal, and it digs into the inner line of the uterus called the endometrium. Now here's the problem. That corpus luteum, remember, is programmed to self-destruct. We don't see it here because this is in a cutaway view of the ovary. It's programmed to self-destruct in two weeks. And remember when the sex hormone levels drop low, the endometrium sloughs off. So if the endometrium sloughs off and the woman has her period, what's gonna to happen to the embryo? Well, it'll literally be flushed. So from the embryo's point of view, this is not a good thing. So what happens? Well, for the rest of this presentation, we will explore ending number two. What happens if the woman becomes pregnant? And we will then examine early human development. And in this picture here, you will see a couple of the extra embryonic membranes that we will talk about later. This is the amniotic sac, and this is a cutaway view. This is a partial view of the chorion. All right, so our two second possible endings. If a woman is pregnant, in the first 10 days after fertilization, we um, the embryo goes through the stages we just described. Cleavage, which is rapid to mitosis without cell growth, morula of the blastula, and implantation. The embryo must prevent menses. Why? We just went over this. If the woman has her menstrual flow, it's a bye-bye embryo. So therefore, the woman, I'm sorry, the embryo must take complete hormonal control of the woman's body. And this is just crazy. If you look at your lecture guide and if you look at a little period at the end of a sentence, that's how big the blastocyst is. Literally, if you look on your lecture guide, it, it period at the end of sentence, a dot on the eye, that is uh, the hundred cell stage of the human embryo. That's how big it is. So this little tiny human organism secretes HCG. Are you ready? It stands for human chorionic gonadotropin. Now, <laughs> it's on your lecture guide. In case you didn't figure that out, we are on the second page of your lecture guide. All right. Which of those three words is familiar to you? Well, undoubtedly human is. Chorion, if you've done your study guide for chapter 34, you should have read about the four extra embryonic membranes that are present around the embryo of any amniotic animal. So there's four extra embryonic membranes. You'll see them again in this PowerPoint, amnion, chorion, allantois, and yolk sac. So this is one of the four membranes, the chorion, and it secretes a gonadotropin. You've seen that word before. Whether you remember it or not, you've seen this word before. So to review, a tropin is any hormone that affects another endocrine gland. 
and a gonadotropin would obviously, this hormone would affect a gonad, which is an endocrine gland. So let's think about this. We're talking about an embryo in a female. So the gonad affected by this hormone would be the ovary. So once again, what the human embryo does at the blastocyst stage is to create a hormone called HCG. HCG maintains the corpus luteum so that it keeps secreting progesterone. And since there is still progesterone floating around in the woman's bloodstream, it maintains the corpus luteum and there is no menses. Yay! From the embryo's point of view. And by the way, wrong way, <laughs> by the way, this is what a positive pregnancy detects. Because again, this is a hormone. It's traveling throughout the woman's bloodstream. If she gets a blood test to get a pregnancy test, it'll test for HCG. But remember, your liver is constantly deactivating hormones. And then the deactivated form of the hormone shows up in the urine. So you know those little kits you can buy at the drugstore and you pee on a little thing that looks like a thermometer and you see if it says plus or minus? Well, that's what it's testing for. It's testing for inactivated HCG in the woman's urine. I certainly messed that up again. I'm just so wonderful at messing that up. I hit page down. So at least you know I'm human, huh? All right, I think this is where we were. Sorry about that. You think I'd learn by now? All right, so this is a pictorial form of the same th idea. So the egg is ovulated, pops out of the ovary. So here you can see the big ovary. Here's the corpus luteum right here. The egg pops out into the oviduct. It's fertilized. It undergoes cleavage division, two cell, four cell, eight, 16, 32, all right? The solid ball stage is the morula, and they do a nice job here. You can see the morula is no bigger than the original zygote. Then you get to the blastula stage. In humans, called the blastocyst, still no bigger than the original zygote. And the blastula digs in and plants into the endometrium. Now let's picture this, because again, I just think this is really cool. This human organism, did I miss? Um, which is no bigger than a period at the end of a sentence, it starts cranking out this hormone, HCG. And HCG travels all through the woman's bloodstream, but it's a gonadotropin, and that target tissue is the corpus luteum. So again, even though this is circulating all throughout the woman's body, this it targets the corpus luteum. It keeps the corpus luteum from dying, and it keeps producing progesterone. Once again, progesterone flows all through the woman's body, promotes the development of secondary sex characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. But in this story, what we're most concerned about is that it maintains the endometrium. So when the embryo embeds, it is safe. It's not sloughed off. So again, sometimes a picture helps to keep all these new terms straight. So this is just in words what we just said. If a pregnancy occurs, the blastocyst secretes HCG, which travels through the bloods, through the bloods, yeah, through the bloodstream, targets the ovaries, and maintains the corpus luteum. Therefore, the corpus luteum keeps making progesterone and maintains the endometrium. Yay! There's a there's a, a embryo implanted. She's pregnant. Woohoo! All right. So if you put this all together, let's take a medical moment. First of all, what's the first sign of pregnancy, and what's the medical test for pregnancy? Write down these answers so that you can tell Dr. House. All right, did you write down the answer? This week when I asked the question, I um, called on a male student, and he said the first sign of uh, pregnancy is when the endometrium fails to slough off the uterus. And I said, you are absolutely scientifically correct. And then I said, Ladies, what do we call that? And they all said, this period. And that, that both are correct. So when a woman first starts to suspect that she's pregnant is when she misses her period. Her period is late. And again, the medical test is the presence of HCG in the blood or the urine. Now let's think for a moment. Let's say a, a woman has missed her period. How old is the embryo? So we'll think about this for a minute. So she has about a month long cycle. Perfect cycle is considered 28 days. She has her menstrual flow at the beginning. 
So when menses starts, that's day one of a cycle. Let's say ovulation happens on day 14. In a textbook woman, ovulation happens on day 14. So let's say the sperm are waiting right there, fertilize that egg right away. So then you have cleavage division. And remember the um, corpus luteum self-destructs after two weeks. So this would be a two week period right here. Lovely artwork, huh? So most people, when I ask this question, I said, how old is the embryo when a woman's missed her period? People say two weeks, but think about it. Okay, she's supposed to have her period now on let's say day 29, but she's late. She doesn't have her period. Does a woman freak out if she's one day late? Well, the answer is basically no, right? It's not unusual at all, especially um, for women at the beginning and their end of their fertility to have irregular cycles. And stress can suppress ovulation, delay a period. So yeah, um, if a woman is a day or, or, or two late, she probably she doesn't think anything of it. Three days, even four days. Now it gets to be a week later and she hasn't had her period. She was expecting her, her period a week ago and now it's a week later. Now she might, might have to think, huh, this is weird. And if she's had intercourse, she might actually think, oh my gosh, am I pregnant? So about when the, her menstrual flow is about a week late, that is when most women first suspect, yes, they might be pregnant. And at this time, the embryo is already three weeks old. Now, some women, though, don't really track their, their cycles and, and track their periods, which is really not a good idea. Because honestly, a lot of health problems manifest themselves as a problem with her cycle. And so if you are a woman of reproductive age, you, in listening to this, you should be tracking your cycle. But that's an aside. For whatever reason, some women don't, you know, chart their cycle. I mean, just you can just circle it on a calendar. It's no big deal. But some women don't. So some women actually miss two periods. Oh, that's lovely. Miss two periods before they begin to suspect they're pregnant. So if she missed two periods, then how, you just add four more weeks on. How old is the embryo? All right, so some, some women don't suspect they're pregnant until the embryo is seven weeks old. Meanwhile, what is happening to the embryo? Well, we're going to go over the stages of early human development. And again, you've even heard of most of these before, but I'm going to point out to you this part, organogenesis occurs two to eight weeks after fertilization two to eight weeks. So in other words, all major organs of this new human organism are formed and functional eight weeks after fertilization, which to me is really scary considering a lot of women don't suspect they're pregnant until the embryo is seven weeks old. So it's really amazing that we all survived our mother not knowing she was pregnant right away. So let's go through these stages. Fertilization, as hopefully you know, know from your study guides, is a union of the sperm and egg nucleus, nuclei, I guess I should say. We casually refer it to the union as sperm or egg, but technically fertilization is not complete until the sperm nucleus fuses with the egg nucleus, and then you have a diploid zygote. The DNA is merged, and we have the very first cell of the brand new organism. I'll sort of do cleavage and gastrulation together. Again, this is reviewing concepts. So I sort of like ending up here that we, you, we covered at the beginning of this unit when we went over characteristics of all animals. So as we've said repeatedly, cleavage is rapid mitosis without cell growth. So here's your review. In mammals is our cleavage radial or spiral. And again, in case uh, you haven't figured this out, we're sort of at the bottom of the second and the top of the third page of your lecture guide, sort of together. All right, mammals, we are deuterostomes, just like echinoderms. So is our cleavage radial or spiral? You should know this from your old study guides. Well, the answer you should pick, hopefully you picked hopefully was radial. Um, in mammals, is our cleavage division determinate or indeterminate? Well, this time, the correct answer is indeterminate. So what that means is we could remove a cell from a developing human embryo during cleavage division, and we would not have a child born without an arm or a leg, because this means that in during cleavage divisions, none of the cells of the developing embryo have quote-unquote chosen a fate. In other, words, none of the, in other words, none of the genes have been permanently turned off. Any cell can still become anything. 
until we get to the gastrulous stage, none of the genes in any of the cells have been permanently turned off. All right, so again, cleavage division, zygote through morula. Again, we can remove a cell from an embryo at any stage from the zygote up to the blastocyst. Won't hurt the embryo. So here we have the pictorial form. Zygote, eight cell stage, they skip to the blastula. Again, if I remove some cells, wouldn't hurt it at all. In fact, remember we can split this in half and each half would grow into a, a new human organism in its own right. You wouldn't have just a left half or a right half of a kid being born. Um, this won't work with protostomic development. And also to review some terms, all right, so the cavity, this is review for you for your upcoming test. The cavity inside a blastula is called the blastocele. This is a logical term. Seal means cavity. The cavity inside the blastula is the blastocele. And then this new opening starts forming. As soon as you have this little invagination, it's not a blastula anymore, it's a gastrula. But because this little opening forms on the blastula, this little opening is called the blastopore. Again, I'd rather call it the gastropore. But it forms on the blastula. As soon as it invaginates, it's a gastrula, not a blastula. All right, and you can see, so here's the blastopore, here's the blastocele here, and as we get into a later and later gastrula, the blastocele is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Um, this new opening that's forming in the gastrula, again, I would love to call this the gastrocele, but I did not name it. The official word is the archeteron, and this is lined with endoderm, and it will become the digestive tract of the embryo. More review here. So again, deuterostomes, which include chorodates, like us mammals, any kind of derms. Um, the cleavage is radial, which means one cell is directly um, over the other. In spiral, one cell is, you see that is sort of staggered over the two, so it has sort of a spiral looking shape. Indeterminate, we can cut this embryo in half and it won't hurt it. Each will grow into a uh, a new whatever type of animal that is, starfish or frog or whatever. But with protostomes, already it's determined. So if you take a cell out, it, it, you would hurt that growing embryo because this is the fate has been determined. And if you remove it, this embryo would be missing a part. In protostomes and deuterostome, the mesoderm has a slightly different way of forming, and we are just really not going to deal with that. And finally, uh, where, what develops from the blastopore, the mouth or the anus. So as you recall, in protostomes, the, ma uh, protostomes, the mouth forms first. Deuterostomes, like ourselves, well, our anus forms first, lovely thought as that is, and our mouth forms second. So hopefully this is a nice little review for you. All right, so back to our story, early human development. Are you getting tired of seeing this picture? We have the um, zygote forming in the oviduct. We have cleavage division, rapid mitosis without cell growth, and we have the blastocyst implanting in the endometrium. What I want to do right now is give you a close-up look at a photograph of an actual human blastocyst. All right, this is an actual human blastocyst. You notice it's not a completely hollow inside. We This is still the blastocele right here. That's labeled C for blastocele. Here we have the inner cell mass. This will grow into the actual human body, arms, legs, and whatnot. But this outer layer of cells, this is the trophoblast. And the trophoblast will develop into the four what we call extra embryonic membranes. So this blastocyst is about 100 cells large. And the interesting thing is not all the cells will actually form the human body proper. Again, the cells of the trophoblast will develop into these supporting membranes. Uh, which are called, again, the four extra embryonic membranes. These are common in all animals that are amniotes. So remember what amniotes are, rept all reptiles, including birds, all mammals. And the four extra, amni uh, extra embryonic membranes are the amnion, the chorion, the allantois, and the yolk sac. And the two that I'm most concerned that you know about are the amnion and the chorion. So the amnion I showed you at that picture at the beginning. And you know I'm a terrible artist, but just bear with me. So let's say we have this 
fetus growing inside his or her mom. I told you I'm a terrible artist. Oh gosh, that's horrible. So here's this baby. Yes, yeah, sort of. Oh gosh, yeah, I forgot to. Uh, this is really terrible. All right. So this is its umbilical cord. All right. And then around the growing fetus is oh, that I missed. All right. Is the amniotic sac. That is just his leg is hanging out of the amniotic sac. Yeah, bad drawing. All right, sorry about that. So the amniotic sac is a fluid-filled sac that envelopes the developing fetus. And it's filled with fluid. It acts as a sort of a shock absorber. So the oxygen is coming into the baby through the umbilical cord. So this developing kid does not breed through his or her lungs. What uh, the fetus does is it practices breathing in and out amniotic fluid. So the lungs at this time are fluid filled. So he breathes in, breathes out the amniotic fluid. He or she also um, will slough off cells into the amniotic fluid. And if you've ever heard of amniocentesis, what happens is, uh, hang on to your seats, they stick a six inch needle through the abdomen of the woman, because remember this is inside her pregnant babe, belly right here. They stick a six inch needle into the belly of the woman, and then they withdraw um, about um, a few ounces of amniotic fluid, like about a, about a oh, half of a pop can worth. They pull out this amniotic fluid, and then the cells in there, which are fetal cells, totally fetal, not maternal, uh, they can do a karyotype and do a chromosomal analysis and, for instance, see if the child would have um, a genetic defect like Down syndrome. You could also sex the baby this way, but it's usually not recommended because there's a very slight possibility that this needle coming in could trigger a spontaneous miscarriage. And usually you don't want that to happen. So again, the amniotic sac, it's a um, fluid-filled shock absorber. When the woman's water breaks during pregnancy, this is what's happening, is um, the baby's heading out the birth canal, this sac breaks, psh, and the water gushes out. So first she loses that cervic, cervical plug we talked about, and then her water breaks, psh, and that, that's a good sign that baby is coming out. All right, let's talk about the chorion. Now, actually... If I could draw the chorion, I could withdraw it like here on the advanced stage. But where I'm going to draw it again on the next slide. Lovely artwork again. All right, let's give you a little information first. The chorion is the embryonic membrane that digs into the endometrium, and together they form the placenta. So the placenta is a really cool organ because it is made out of half fetal tissue and half maternal tissue. So let's picture this. So there's, it's actually called chorionic villi. These finger-like projections of the chorion dig into the endometrium. So this is, represents the chorion. Ah, I forgot, I always forget to hold up. So this is the umbilical cord going up here. And what I'm coloring in in red at the bottom, this represents the endometrium. So this is the inner lining of the uterus that sloughs off when the woman has her menstrual flow. So it's full of blood and blood vessels. So the chorionic villi dig into the endometrium. All right, now, I wish I had another color, but I don't. Blood vessels come from the fetus. The fetus would be up here. Blood vessels come through the umbilical cord and then they go into these chorionic villi and back up again. We have another one. All right, you get the idea. Now, glucose and oxygen from the mom diffuse from the endometrium into the fetal circulation. So little molecules of glucose and oxygen diffuse from mom's endometrium into the fetal circulation, into the blood, and it back up through the umbilical cord, so this would be the umbilical vein, back up to the fetus. And then also in this blood is carbon dioxide that the fetus made in, in um, waste products, and that diffuses from the fetal circulation into the endometrium and then back into mom's circulation. So yes, the mom is eating for two because glucose has to diffuse from the endometrium into the fetal circulation, 
and food and oxygen go through the umbilical cord up to the kid. Waste and carbon dioxide come down here and they diffuse from fetal circulation, from the fetal circulation into the endometrium. So this is important. Oxygen and carbon dioxide, nutrients and waste cross the placenta by diffusion. They diffuse from one bloodstream to another. The fetal and maternal blood do not mix. So again, fetal arteries come out, get exposed to oxygen, fetal veins go back through the umbilical cord. So hopefully that is clear. And the placenta, again, is an organ made of half maternal tissue, the endometrium, and half fetal tissue, the chorion. And we talked about the chorion before because that was the part of the embryo that made human chorionic gonadotropin. All right, so again, the tropoblast becomes the supporting membranes, the extra embryonic membranes. The inner cell mass here, that will become the human body proper, arm, legs, etc., hearts, brains, etc. So the inner cell mass, this is where gastrulation occurs. This is where you have that invagination, and as soon as the you have that invagination and the formation of the gastropore, these three embryonic, these three embryonic germ layers form ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. And we have talked about these before. So again, we have the blastopore forming, which since we're deuterostorms, this will be our anus. Our mouth will form at the other end. We have ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm will form in the middle. And this marker is beautiful because mesoderm in every biology book in the world is red. So to end up here, uh, let's look at the fate of the three primary germ layers. No, you do not have to memorize this whole chart. I will pick out certain parts. This is what you need to know for your test. Ectoderm becomes skin and nervous system, which includes the brain and nerves. And just please remember your eye is basically an extension of your brain. So let's focus on that. That ectoderm becomes skin and brain and nerves. Mesoderm becomes notochord, bones, muscles, circulatory system. That would include blood. So let's focus on that. The mesoderm becomes notochord, bones, blood, and muscle. And then our endoderm, that will develop into the um, lining of the digestive tract. So I think that's a reasonable amount to have you memorize. Um, and again, these three little germ layers formed in gastrulation. So gastrula forms about, in humans, about um, the 14th day after fertilization. And then all this happens, organogenesis happens, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm form all these body parts by week eight of pregnancy. Isn't that incredible? So if you look at the bottom of your lecture guide, on your own, I have another link. It gives you a brief outline of pregnancy. So know the major events of each trimester and just, just read the headlines and know the answer to those three questions at the bottom of your lecture guide uh, for your test or your quiz. Uh, what's the first organ to form and become functional? When are all major organs formed and functional? I think I just gave you the answer for that. And when does the embryo become a fetus? And actually, the answers to number two and number three are the same. All right, I've hoped you've enjoyed this. And if you have any questions, as usual, feel free to uh, post them in the chat room. Bye for now.